This is five on your side at six, focused on you. A Lyft driver who kidnapped and raped a woman in downtown St. Louis learned today he will spend more than a decade in prison. Thank you for being with us. I'm Ann Allred. And I'm Kelly Jackson. And for Mike Bush, a judge sentenced Larry Ward this morning, a day after he pleaded guilty. Five on your side's Christine Byers was in the courtroom today and has an exclusive interview with the victim. It's been 1,564 days since Kristen Giangaro was kidnapped and raped by her Lyft driver. I calculated the days. It happened on June 22, 2019, when Giangara called the rideshare company to get a ride home from a bachelorette party in downtown St. Louis. Larry Ward was the driver, and he was a felon. She says what was supposed to be a six-minute ride turned into 51 minutes of terror. I never wanted him to die in prison. Like I was I, very clear on that from the beginning. I, I just wanted a consequence, and I wanted accountability. Ward rejected a plea deal in April, opting instead to go to trial. There's still just been this part that's been lingering and that and knowing that at any moment this could come back and I'd have to relive everything. Then on Monday, as jury selection was to begin, Ward pleaded guilty to kidnapping and rape, putting his fate entirely in the judge's hands. I am grateful that I don't have to testify and be re-traumatized, like I've said. Um, but I was also very prepared to testify and I was very prepared to go to trial. In court Tuesday, when he was sentenced, Ward said nothing when given the chance. Giangara read a three page statement talking about how the attack has forever changed her life. There's a reclaiming of my own identity and my own life that, that starts today. Giangara has advice for other survivors that has helped her. The only thing that you can do is whatever is the best that's for you. And so the only way to heal is to do whatever is best for you and not for anyone else. Christine Byers, five on your side. Giangara is also suing Lyft, alleging it cut quarters on checking Ward's criminal history. That civil lawsuit is still pending. And to read more of the victim's impact statement, you can read Christine's story in the As Seen on TV section on KSDK.com. Dozens of homeless people have left City Hall in downtown St. Louis, and some are staying put. This is after the city was about to remove the encampment last night, but they waited until today to make that move. We have two reports tonight. Let's begin with Five on Your Side, Justina Coronel. And Justina, we hear the camp has been getting smaller. What are you seeing out there? Yeah, so it's been getting smaller and smaller and just really in a two hour time frame. So we were here just a few hours ago. There were multiple tents out here and multiple people. Now that's dwindled to about three tents and there's some people still on the park grounds, but really just a lot of people have left. We were even seeing city forestry grabbing some bags and putting that into storage. Now we've learned that at least 15 people have gone into shelter. Now this all comes after last night. There was a lot of commotion after police arrived here at 10 o'clock because the property is a city park and it has a curfew. But soon the city's Department of Human Services realized it was unsafe to have people leave at that time frame since many of the shelters have a curfew. Now we've learned the city secured 50 beds at shelters in the city and county. That's why today outreach workers were here sharing transitional housing, transportation and storage information. City leaders said this month long problem created safety concerns, including dozens of EMS calls involving overdoses and seizures. Violence has also been reported here here just this morning we saw one person throw a punch at another but we've also seen bystanders leaving city hall yell and argue with people at the site now nonprofits and organizations have also showed up from from places like st patrick center arch city defenders urban league ready to provide employment and housing you're basically uplifting their house because that's their house and you're throwing it away and you're throwing them away and you just can't do these people like this and i just felt that it was just my job and my duty as a person, not as a, you no, know, it's just as a person in general, to address them and make sure that they have the right type of situation. As far as what's next, that curfew here is 10 o'clock, so people will be forced to leave. Reporting live, Justina Cornell, five on your side. And Mayor Tashara Jones is facing political backlash for ordering the eviction of the homeless encampment. Our political editor, Mark Maxwell, is here with more on the new developments. Kelly, make no mistake about it, any candidate who wants to challenge Mayor Jones for her job in 2025 is watching this saga unfold very closely right now. The mayor is already facing outcry and condemnation from her progressive flank. 
Some activists in the city, many of whom supported her vocally in 2021, feel betrayed two and a half years later. One of them even raising questions about whether or not she may have lost her way as the self-described people's mayor. Writing online, quote, when we voted for a St. Louis that works for everyone, I assumed we meant the prison uh, and unhoused too. The mayor's moves have agitated, possibly alienated some of her most passionate base. And she's even won praise from Alderman Tom Oldenburg, one of the most conservative members of the board of aldermen. But all the political maneuvering aside, the optics and the timing couldn't be worse. Just yesterday, we heard from a homeless shelter director who said the city can no longer abide sweeping the poor and unhoused under the rug. Now it appears the city may be sweeping them under the red carpet as Vice President Kamala Harris comes to town for the DNC meeting later this week. The mayor's office insists that timing is a coincidence and had nothing to do with this decision. Instead, pointing to the growing number of tents that have gathered there, along with dangerous disruptions and disturbances. Illinois State Police are trying to identify a car they say could be involved in Friday's deadly tanker truck crash in Effingham County. Police say the car was headed west on Highway 40 and spotted passing through the Spring Creek Road intersection around 8.30 Friday shortly before the crash. They're asking people in Casey, Montrose, and Tutopolis to check their doorbell and surveillance videos. Five people died in that crash, including a Franklin County pastor. Diamond Palmer traveled to St. Peter's United Church of Christ in New Haven. Diamond. Well, and members of the church say Dr. Dan Smith was in Effingham County for a high school football game. He was 67 years old at the time of his death, and the church has brought an extra pastor so people can continue to grieve. They say last Sunday was emotional for their first service after he died. It's just a lot to process. You know, there's obviously a lot of sadness, frustration. You know, there was so much so much possibility um, in his ministry here. Members of St. Peter's United Church of Christ in New Haven, Missouri are now grieving. Their pastor, Dr. Dan Smith, was one of five people killed in a crash in Effingham County, Illinois. Dr. Smith had just been installed as the church's permanent pastor in June. Chrissy Gilbert sat on the committee that hired him and says her son was extremely close with him. Yeah, there are questions. Um, Will the answers to those questions bring Dan back? Will it bring back those others who lost their life that evening or those others who are still struggling in the hospital with, with the repercussions? It doesn't, answers don't change that. And so I think the important thing is that we fall back on our faith. And now it's trying to keep the church going. You know, that's what Dan would want. Gilbert says the Sunday after the crash was very tough on members. They brought in extra pastors to talk to members. Rob Hazeman remembers his pastor as being down to earth and dedicated to his faith. It was hard, hard to understand and to, to really comprehend. The joyful memories of him being with the kids and, and dealing with us as church has been great. But, you know, just the, the realization that he's not going to be here anymore, it's, it's pretty tough. Smith's sister is expected to arrive in town today to set up funeral arrangements. Meanwhile, Illinois State Police are asking anyone who may have video that captured this crash to contact them. You should call their Division of Criminal Investigation at 217-342-7881. And five others were hurt in the aftermath, including four members of the Mizzou Swim Club. The tanker involved in the crash was carrying anhydrous ammonia, causing a cloud of chemicals to leak into the air. According to a gun GoFundMe set up by the students, they were headed to a meet at Ohio State when they got caught in the gas cloud. All four were taken to the hospital. Three of them were airlifted. Coming up, a Granite City grooming business that's been around for more than four decades, devastated by fire. How longtime customers are responding. And later, grieving families dealt another blow, the funeral mix-up that is now a full-blown investigation. Temperatures will be tumbling heading towards the weekend. Could some of us see our first frost? Probably not most of us will explain.